Hey, it's Danny from Conscious Calisthenics, and I am here with this lovely man that calls himself the Fasting Fat Man or the Incredible Shrinking Man or Big John. And before we go on to do this amazing interview that I've been waiting to do for so long, uh, what I first want to mention is a disclaimer. We are not doctors, we are not giving you medical advice. If you choose to do anything that lovely Fasting Fat Man shares us today, you have to take it into your own hands and if anything goes wrong, then it's all down to you. It's got nothing to do with us. And he's just sharing from his own personal experience. And I hope that this video interview inspires you and motivates you, especially for someone that's got excess body fat, like Fasting Fat Man had a lot more than he has now and has managed to massively get his body weight down. So yeah, thank you for joining us today. So if you could just give us an introduction into, yeah, who you are, what you're all about, and anything else you think would be valuable to share with us. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Big John, a.k.a. The Amazing Fasting Fat Man, a.k.a. The Incredible Shrinking Man. And I'm here today to, uh, you know, help enlighten um, the audience here about my journey from 530 pounds to uh, 292 pounds. I started at 530 pounds um, on December 11th of uh, 2018 and as of I believe it's the 8th Thursday was the 8th right yeah as of the 8th of uh, this month August 2019 I weighed in at 292 pounds the way I was able to accomplish this was I did a three-week intermittent fasting regimen with a four-hour eating window and then I went into a 150-day fast um, from January 2nd until May 31st. After the fast, I did a 12-day refeeding schedule. Um, and then I slipped into a keto OMAD regimen um, um, for 60 days, which ended on Sunday. And I switched over to another regimen that I'm going to explain on uh, my upcoming video. But pretty much um, what got me into uh, this type of long-term fasting is a situation back in December where I was sitting on the couch and my son, who wasn't a uh, one-year-old yet, he was crawling towards the kitchen and I couldn't get off the couch to stop him. Like, I was struggling. My feet was buckling. Even propping myself, propping myself up was hard to do. I did manage to get off the couch, but then I started thinking this could have been a very dangerous situation. Um, and then my mind started wandering even further. It's like, my goodness, I could have been holding him and carrying him to change his diaper and catch a heart attack. So then now, you know, I fall on him. My wife come home and find me and our son dead. Or I could sit on the couch and catch a heart attack. And he's out there on the floor crawling into Lord knows what kind of danger. So I decided that, you know, I seriously need to make a change. What really did it for me was um, I'm a spiritual person and I always look for signs uh, from God. And it just so happened when I get bombarded with all these grisly images of uh, me dying or causing the death of my son or causing harm to come to my son because of my weight, my wife comes home and she tells me that she wants to go on a raw diet. And she would like me to join her. Now, the thing is, when you guys uh, eventually get to see my wife, I can finally talk in front of the camera. My wife is not a big woman. She's small. In fact, we're more like uh, um, the honeymooners than Mike and Molly, you know. So when she told me this, knowing that she didn't need to go on a diet, even after picking up a little something from having a baby, automatically I knew it was because it was her way of telling me that she's concerned about my weight. You know, because when you're morbidly obese, people, you know, especially loved ones, try to tell you um, about your weight and you become massively defensive. Like you don't want to hear it. You got it under control. But obviously you don't have it under control. Otherwise, you wouldn't be the size you are. But we live in this constant state of denial where we believe that weight loss is just around the corner and we indulge in our habits nonstop. So, again, when she told me this. I decided I had to make a change, so I started researching ways to lose weight quick. And the reason I wanted to lose it quick is because I literally felt that the time was up, that I was going to die because I was morbidly obese. And that's the first time I felt that in my life. 
I felt literally that I'm sitting around just waiting to die. I'm not going to get to see my kid graduate kindergarten um, or anything. So um, upon researching, I came across uh, Angus Barbieri. And, you know, this is a man who weighed 456 pounds. He fasted for 182 days, came down to 180 pounds, and more importantly, never regained the fat, never became morbidly obese again. So I thought that would be the perfect vehicle for me because I've lost weight before in the past uh, through, through uh, caloric restriction, working out with personal trainers, uh -huh. and I would always gain it back because I never got over my food addiction. So I felt Angus went the same, went, you know, because he was 456 pounds and was obese uh, all his life, he had a similar addictive uh, relationship with food as I did. So I thought like, okay, if I fast long term, I could break, the, I could break this uh, addiction. So I set out to do 30 days. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do 30 days fast. So after the, the keto, reg I, I mean, I'm sorry, after the... Uh, the um, intermittent fasting regimen with the four hour eating window. I, uh, you know, I, I started fasting on uh, January 2nd. And I set out just to do 30 days. You know, I told myself, look, if you could make it 30 days, if you can't even make it 30 days, if you could just do seven, just do seven, what we could do is every month we'll do a seven day fast and eventually the weight will come off. But you just got to do something. So um, because of what I did in terms of the, um, the intermittent fasting with the four-hour window, my body was now used to being in a fasted state for 20 hours. So when I did start the um, actual fast, the first two days I wasn't hungry. I didn't get hungry until day um, three and four, and at which point I was only hungry during my actual eating window, around my eating window. It wouldn't. It would just come and go, come and go, and then by day five, hunger was gone. I was never hungry again to this day. I don't know what hunger feels like. I went through the 150 day fast without hunger. During the refeeding cycle, even though I was just drinking um, broth in the beginning and then soup and slowly reintroducing food back into my system and not even having a lot of food, I didn't feel hunger. Hmm. During the OMAD, eating one meal a day, uh, ketogenic one meal a day, I set out to do to eat anywhere between 1800 and 2000 calories but my stomach shrank so much from the fast that you know days were going where i was having like 1100 1200 calories 1400 because i could never finish my food before my window closed even though i started with a four hour window um i know omad is typically one to two hours but i started with a four hour window to give my time myself time to eat because i didn't want to be in a caloric deficit but that didn't work out. Um, you know, I, the, once the window closed, even if I have food, I never went back to that food. I put it in the fridge or I throw it away, but I, I never ate past my window. I refused to. Like, I'm going to eat, you know, um, I'm going to discipline myself to just stick with what I'm doing. And it's worked. You know, I, I've lost a ton of weight. Um, I did manage to um, shrink the window down to three hours. I still run into the same problem where in the three hours, Sometimes I don't get to finish what I set out to eat, but it doesn't matter. Like I said, I'm just never hungry. I keep going, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, so that's really good. And then what something that you mentioned was that you tried many different things. So you got on the three weeks of like fasting around 20 hours and eating for around a four-hour window, and you said you had tried so many other different things in the past prior to that. And you said you'd rebounded and then obviously you found something that worked. And prior to that three weeks of intermittent fasting, did you have any prior experience with extended water fasting or intermittent fasting at all? I had no experience with extended fasting. I did have experience with intermittent fasting. Um, when I first learned about intermittent fasting, I started out doing an eight hour, um, eight sixteen um, mm -hmm. intermittent fasting. So I would eat for eight hours, the window would close and fast for 16 hours. And when I did it, I was incredibly disciplined when it came to the not eating part in the 16 hours. But in the eight hours that I was eating, that's where I messed up. I was not eating properly because, you know, through researching, I encompassed this philosophy about it's not what you eat, it's when you eat. 
And I guess I set out to test that theory because I ate like a pig and I ate unhealthy. I ate fast food, pizzas, um, you know, dripping bacon cheeseburgers. Like I ate unhealthy within that eight hour window and I overate within that eight hour window. It wasn't like I was having three square meals. I was fitting everything in there. <laughs> and once the window closed, I was disciplined. All of a sudden I wouldn't eat. But in that 16 hours, I'm, I'm just thinking about what I'm going to have the next day. It's the attic in me. So all I'm thinking about in that 16 hours, ooh, I can't wait till my window open. I'm going to have this. I'm going to have that. I have everything planned out. You know, so it didn't really work for me. I, in fact, I gained weight for the month that I did it. But even upon gaining weight, I learned a valuable lesson. I learned that, like, the amount of weight I put on should have been far more considering how much I ate. Yes. So I knew there was something to this intermittent fasting thing if I ate correctly. So I told myself, you know what? I'm going to try it again. Um, and this time I'm going to eat healthy in that eight hours. And I just kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. Like most morbidly obese people do. We BS ourselves into believing that, you know, the, 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 the next great weight loss is right around the corner. <laughs> it's been around the corner all our lives and we've never done it, yeah. you know? So when, when I did decide on the fast, I knew I couldn't just jump into a fast. Not the way I was eating. That was a recipe for failure. You know, like there was no way I'd be able to do it. So that's why I decided, okay, I'm going to do an intermittent fasting regimen. But instead of doing eight hours, which um, allowed me to just constantly fill in the void with food for no reason, I'm going to do four hours. It makes it virtually impossible to overeat within that four hours. And pretty much that worked. I mean, it was difficult in the beginning on um, the first five, six days. But then once I got a hold of it, I mean, it was just a breeze all the way into the fast. And that's one of the reasons why the fast was so successful, because I really disciplined my body. And that's also why I'm successful with the OMAD, because now my body is just used to being in a fasted state. Yeah. So like the familiar, the familiar being is, is fasting and the aberration is eating. You see, and, and one of the reasons why I decided to do OMAD, and I'm also doing OMAD for life. It's not just something I'm doing to get to my goal weight of uh, 195 pounds. The reason I decided to do OMAD is because it is something unfamiliar to my body. See, I figured if I came off the fast and worked my way back into a three meal a day regimen, it'd be easy for my mind to spontaneously regress and go back to unhealthy eating and a bad way of eating yeah. and things that it's familiar with. So with OMAD, there is no going back to something that you're not familiar that you're familiar with because my body's not familiar with eating one meal a day you yeah. know the only thing it's familiar with now is being in a fasted state which it embraces and that's one of the reasons why i'm never hungry yeah nice no, that's really good and would you say like switching from 68 to 24 that it just helped you which obviously obese people have like an unhealthy relationship with food would you say switching to the 24 allowed you to form a healthier relationship with food and be more disciplined around food that helped you then go in the direction to prepare yourself more to be on an extended water fast absolutely because what happens is within that four hours you know um when because because my wife did do the raw and whenever she would come home she would fix a big salad so my last meal was always a big salad the first meal, I you know, I could cook up an omelet with some vegetables, things of that nature. But the thing is, like the first meal, I would be sated, right? Then like within like, you know, about an hour and a half, two hours, I would have what the equivalent of lunch would be, um, which also could be, it could be a sandwich. It could be whatever it is, it wasn't overeating. So then when my wife came home and fixed a big salad, that would be the final meal that stuffed me. So within the day, I didn't overeat. I didn't get like three, four, five, six thousand calories like I normally get. So I ended up losing weight. And once my body got used to that eating regimen after the first week, it was just automatic it's to the point where like, again, the first two days of fasting, the window came and closed and my body was like, oh, OK, no problem. You know, he'll eat tomorrow. You know, and then by the third day, it was like, hey, something's wrong here. Yeah. We got to remind this guy to eat, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. And it's so good to hear because we have so many people, especially in the Western world, that go from one extreme to the other, like yo-yo diets, extreme calorie restriction, and then they binge, they gain more weight back than they had. But it's yes, so good yes, to hear. That's, 
It's so good to hear that you eased into this. You didn't just go cold turkey, you didn't go all in. You're getting your body more fat adapted, so it's used to fasting and using fat as fuel, so then you can suppress the hunger, and so your body starts to change its circadian rhythms of eating, so it doesn't make you feel hungry throughout the whole day as well. So then, yeah, you obviously did it in the best way possible that is actually sustainable, and like a lot of people that are obese, the things they're doing, like I said, these extreme swings, rather than the middle ground, yeah, I, the, the yo-yo part, that was me in a nutshell. Like, I spent my life losing. I mean, one time I came down real small. Like, you know, I was able, and my, my younger brother, um, you know, he, when he was younger, he was chubby. By, by the time he hit um, his adolescence, he lost all the weight, you know? And I got down to a point where I was able to wear, like, extra large clothes, the same clothes as him, like, literally, but I couldn't sustain it. It's like, I would get small and that would be a reason for me to get big. Like, oh, well, you know what? Look, you deserve it. You've lost all this weight. You could eat this. You could eat that. And then it goes on. It just keep pyramiding. Before you know it, I've gotten bigger than the starting point where I first lost the weight. And it's been like that all the time. But this time around, I feel that I have broken the addiction. The reason I feel that is because for the first time in my life, food is not centered in my mind, it's something I have to remind myself, oh, my God, you got to eat. You know what? <laughs> Whereas before, I would literally look at the clock and say, oh, it's time to eat. But now it's like there's been times where like my window opened up and 40 minutes later, I look at the time. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, I got to eat before the window closed. Yeah. And even me that doesn't have excess body fat, I'm the same. Like, I don't really experience hunger. I'm so used to fasting completely. And once you get to that point, it's so good. And it's like. You just get to a point where rather than food controlling you, you have control over the food, which is obviously the issue with people that get obese. So, yeah, it's just like those yo-yo diets just, just do not work for people like you're saying from your own personal experience. So it's so good to hear that it allowed you to gain control over the food where you're not having to just resist the urge to eat, where you're just like forcing yourself and using your willpower, which you can only have so much willpower, as you know, it's like before it just yeah. breaks. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, and, and the thing is, too, what's funny enough is, and like, it's when you go through it as you fast and you realize something, and you probably notice it too. The longer you fast, the longer you can fast. It's like you know, like like everything about food just slowly leaves you. It leaves your mind. It leaves your body. It leaves your bloodstream. Where like, I mean, if I wanted to, I could have fast like you know, like 300, 400 days. I could see how Angus was able to do it. Because you get to a point where, like, it's no big deal. I mean, it's just another day. You wake up, you don't eat, you just drink your water, and you're good. As long as you're taking your water and your supplements, you don't feel weak, you feel fine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And apart from, like, studying Angus, and I, 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 I'll just quickly make a correction. You said 182 days, but I know you meant to say 382 days because you said that earlier on. Um, I said 182 days, 382 yeah, yeah. days. Um, did... Uh, what was I going to say then? Oh, I've lost my, lost my point where I was going to get there. I can cut this part out one second. Uh, ah, so apart from looking into Angus and seeing how he did fasting, was you just working out what he did and followed exactly what he was doing with his regiment with the water fasting, or did you learn from any other sources as well? No, I did. He was he was a major part of it, but there was another YouTuber uh, named Club Fred. He fasted for, I believe, 75 days, and he had a video with the regiment of, uh, of, of, of him taking apple cider vinegar and pink Himalayan sea salt, you know, as well as the multivitamin. So I adapted, I adapted that from him, um, the um, nutritional yeast and, um, and, the, and, and, and the electrolytes. I got that from Angus from reading his case study that he was giving them um, those things. So I adapted from that from him. Um, there was another YouTuber um, that I seen called, um, the YouTube handle was Aaron Cohen. Now she fasted for, I believe it was 120 days. And she didn't fast, like, I mean, she was a bit chubby, but she fasted for God, you know? So I don't think she took supplements because I think it was a pure water fast. And I think she ran into some trouble because of that. By the time I seen her, like her last video, and like she looked, she looked like a skeleton. Wow. And to me, 
it was more something like it wasn't something that like scared me off like I don't want to do this. It was something that reinforced that I can do this because if she was able to survive 120 days and she's not near as big as me, I should have no problem. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point that you've made and I and I believe from what I've looked into that to do the extended fasting in the safest way, you really need to balance your electrolytes, especially the sodium, potassium, and the oh, magnesium. Absolutely. Like, absolutely. Because, yeah, that's where it can run into very dangerous territory. It can even be for intermittent fasting. That can happen with people, especially on longer intermittent fasting windows and that. So, yeah, that's, that's yeah, it's a good point that you've made. So if anyone goes to do that, I think that's something that really needs to be taken into consideration because yeah otherwise it could be quite dangerous you obviously can just do it on water but i wouldn't necessarily advise it and yeah obviously you're not as well no no i, I believe you you gotta have uh you gotta have uh your your electrolytes that's very important because all that water you drink it flushes the electrolyte out your system and that's that's one of the things that your body can't manufacture from the fat cells no you know so like you deplete your electrolytes and you're not bringing anything in then you're you're going to run into problems things are going to start to fail yeah exactly and would you drink in any specific type of water because some people say you should yeah well in in the beginning it was simply the um i have a filter on my fridge in the beginning i would say the first 70 75 days it was just the um the filter water from my fridge i didn't buy bottled water and then after that i went on a trip to atlantic city and um I had seltzer water for the first time, and that was like champagne. So, the, you know, because I've been fasting so long. I was fasting so long that, like, a lot of people hate the taste of uh, apple cider vinegar. Me, when I put that one tablespoon of apple cider vinegar into the cold water, that was my wine daily. I mean, it just tasted yeah. good. That was some flavor. That, the sea salt, it was flavor. And it, and I look forward to it, you know? So when I went to Atlantic City on a, uh, um, uh, on a business meeting, um, you know, my partners and, 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 and the people we're meeting were drinking liquor and things like that. And I just kept getting seltzer water, seltzer water, <laughs> seltzer water. And after a while, the seltzer water is like champagne. So what I did, I incorporated uh, seltzer water when I came back home. And that would be something that I have for special occasions. Like, you know, I'm watching a basketball game or something. I have a cold <laughs> seltzer water next to me, things like that. But pretty much, like, now I drink every type of water uh you know i um 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 mineral water um um seltzer water i drink any type of water before primarily it was just the the filter water from the fridge yeah okay so strictly staying away just from tap water more specifically which obviously oh no i don't yeah. i don't drink tap yeah. water at all yeah. oh no i don't yeah. trust tap water who knows what kind of nonsense <laughs> yeah. i get into my system. yeah exactly and obviously yeah you said that you'd learned from someone who did around 70 day uh water fast to use apple cider vinegar and the other things but i want to focus more specifically on the apple cider vinegar do can you explain to people why you use the apple cider vinegar because because we spoke about the electrolytes but i think it'd be good for people to know about the apple cider vinegar as well well the apple cider vinegar like when i was reading about like how it's good for the blood and I mean, there's a host of things in the beginning. It's been so long, I can't really remember verbatim. I just know that daily dose, and it also um, uh, suppresses your appetite, yeah. you know, which I felt is something that I needed, you know, when I was fasting because I didn't want the appetite to become vivacious and get me off the fast. But there's like a ton of benefits for apple cider vinegar. I hadn't committed them to memory, but at the time when I was reading up on it, I was like, I have got to incorporate this into the fast yeah yeah for sure and that is a huge one it's definitely suppresses appetite it lowers insulin it helps uh optimize uh your energy levels and so many other things okay that's fine um apart from the apple cider vinegar the electrolytes and water was there anything else that you was consuming or is that literally it during the extended well, no fast? what i had was i had the apple cider vinegar my routine was apple cider vinegar and then um a quarter teaspoon of pink himalayan salt to get my sodium. I bought uh, Dr. Berg's electrolyte powder and I would have that uh, two to three times a day. And um, Dr. Berg's nutritional yeast. Now his nutritional yeast doesn't have any yeast in it. It's just basically a, 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 um, a complex B vitamin, Yeah. you know? So yeah. I would have that too. And, um, and then I'd have a multivitamin. And that was pretty much, and I guess it worked because 
you got to think, I fast for 150 days, and I went through the 12 days of refeeding. I didn't get any refeeding sickness, refeeding edema. David Blaine's fasted for 40 days, and when he was done, he had both. And there's a multimillionaire who had doctors on the scene and everything, and his pure water fast without any kind of supplements left him with refeeding sickness and refeeding edema by the time he was mm. done after only 40 days. Okay, that's very good, important yeah point that you've made there. And with the... Um the amount of salt you were using, just because I know people would like to know very specific details. How much water was you adding, like the salt to and the other various things? 16, 16 ounces. Yep. Six, the apple, everything I, every time I, I had this big mug, it's 16 ounces. And anytime I drank water, it was that 16 ounce mug. So the apple cider vinegar, I wouldn't combine it with um, the salt. Uh -huh. I would have that, pour it in, and that's my first drink on an empty stomach, right? Then about an hour later, I'd have the pink Himalayan salt with the 16 ounce water. Uh, then an hour later, I'd have the um, the 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 uh, the um, electrolytes. Now, with with the electrolytes, I would have the uh, nutritional yeast pills with the electrolytes, you know. And then from there, like you know, I mean, pretty much, like I treated that as my breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah. So I average about you know, yeah, I average about eight of those 16 ounce cups a day. Yeah, okay, cool. And how much of the apple cider vinegar was you using? A tablespoon. Yeah, okay. A cool. tablespoon of apple cider vinegar in the morning and a tablespoon in the evening before I went to sleep. Yeah, okay, cool. And, yeah, let me think. What would be the next question? One second. Um, let me just check my phone. Actually, I'll sure, read sure. those. Um, uh, ah, that's a really good one. During your water fast, because a lot of people recommend this, was your water fast supervised at all unsupervised? Was it just your wife checking on you or, yeah? Well, I mean, my wife, you know, I mean, because she lives with me, so of course, like, she got to see me daily. So if she noticed anything, you know, and she was concerned in the beginning. Um, when I started out, I wasn't supervised. I was supervised for the first, I would say about 40 40 to 50 days, my wife kept pressuring me to let my doctor in on it. Uh, um, and in the beginning, in the beginning, I wasn't going to tell my doctor Jack. I was just going to pop in, have him check my blood work, and you know. But after a while, I relented and I decided to, um, you know, to let the doctor in on it so that he could order tests and make sure that I am, I am fasting healthy. In the back of my mind, what it really was, was I didn't want the doctor to tell me to stop, you know. Or like discourage me from doing it, you know. But then I made up my mind, like, listen, as long as I'm healthy, I'm gonna keep doing it. So like the only way for them to get me to stop is to say, look, this is the impact the fasting fasting is having on you that's negative and could be life threatening. That's the only way I would stop. Other than that, like his opinion on the fasting itself wouldn't make me stop. Yeah. So when I finally did go see the doctor, it wasn't like I was asking him permission. I was just basically telling him, look. This is how much I weighed in the beginning. This is how much I weigh now. I've been fasting for X amount of days. I just need you to uh, monitor my blood and order any tests you feel necessary to ensure that I survive this fast. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. Okay. And pretty much, he, I mean, he he signed on. He was like, okay, you know. And so he ordered, a, he had me do a stress test for my heart. He constantly ordered blood tests to make sure that my electrolyte levels was, was correct. And during the blood test, I was able to see my ketone levels which was always at a 4.0. And you know, the optimal range for fat burning for ketone levels is 1.5 to 3.0. Mine was always at a 4.0. <laughs> so I knew I was burning burning fat like it was going out of stock. <laughs> that was really good that you had that done. So yeah, basically, yeah, apart from when your wife wanted to do that and you went ahead with that, you were basically supervising your own fast. I mean, you say you was just being mindful of like your body and how it was reacting. And would you say if, you'd notice any symptoms of maybe you was getting into dangerous territory, you would have broken the fast or not, would you say? Well, yeah, that's the thing. Like, if, if I notice, like, some things could be expected. Like, I heard that when you're fasting, if you stand up too soon, you might get a little bit dizzy, yeah. you know? So certain things you expect. Um, I never really felt weakness. I never felt dizziness. The only real negative side effect of the fast was uh, my breath was horrible. Like my wife would call it dragon breath, you know, like <laughs> because I, they call it keto, uh, yeah. keto breath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But my my breath was and I didn't smell it. You know, 
I have to, you know, you know, I noticed it was bad when my son fainted. You know, it was just <laughs> horrible. You know? But that was the only negative effect. But a lot of things that like other people say they went through, I didn't go through. I I had no problem with sleeping. In fact, um the fasting cured my uh sleep apnea. I used to have to oh, go wow. to sleep with a CPAP machine and breathe like Darth Vader and lay on my back all night. And after about a month of fasting, a month and a half, I realized that I didn't need a CPAP machine wow. because what happened is I fell asleep in the living room and my wife says, you didn't snore. My wife was the first one who noticed uh, years back um, that I needed, that I had sleep apnea because she said that I would struggle to breathe in the middle of the night. Like I would just stop breathing. She wouldn't hear nothing. Then she hear me go, <gasps> like, you know, like gasping uh-huh. for air. So I went and did a sleep study and find out that I had sleep apnea. And from that point on, they ordered a CPAP machine. And from there, it was just me sleeping on my back with the, with the machine all night, you know? Wow. So apart from those benefits you got on weight loss, what other benefits did you notice? Because obviously, there'd be way more benefits oh, than man, just the things tons. you mentioned. Like, like when, um, like, I have my car, um, which is a truck, SUV. And before, when I used to get in the truck, the seatbelt was snug, which you know, which was good. But the thing is, I had to I had to leave the door open. I couldn't put the seatbelt on with the with the door closed. So rain or shine, the door had to be open before I could snap the seatbelt and then close the door. That doesn't happen no more. When I used to sit in my wife's car, I was so big that I had to hold the seatbelt because New York State has a seatbelt law. So like, and the passenger could get a ticket too. So whenever she would drive, I would hold the seatbelt. And, like, the middle part of the seatbelt was, like, in the upper part of my stomach. Like, it wouldn't even go around. And I would just kind of hold it there just in case co- cops seen us. Now, I get in my car. I close the door. I could latch the seatbelt on. I get in her car. I, I could put the seatbelt on, and there's plenty of give. Um, I'm able to tie my shoes from any position. I could sit down and tie my shoes. I could stand up and bend over and tie my shoes. That's something I couldn't do before. Um, even being able to get my zipper down to use the bathroom at my heaviest, I couldn't do that. What I had to do was pull down my pants because I couldn't put my arms around to actually reach and wow. pull the zipper down. Wow. You know, so I had to actually pull down my pants every time I need to urinate. The whole pants had to go down. You wow. know, but now I could just unzip my pants. Um, my belt. The, the way I used to do it was I would tie my belt and put it through the loops before I put on my pants and then kind of shimmy into the pants because there was no way to tie the belt once the pants was on me. I couldn't reach around my stomach to go under the belly and tie the belt. Um, Bathroom. I got to the point where first it started out where like I had to stand up to uh, clean myself after number two. And then after a while, I had to stand next to a wall to bend my right arm to be able to reach over and clean myself under, uh, after wow. number two. Like, as I got bigger, and this is something that I realized that I'm getting smaller, every warning sign that pops up, I just kept ignoring because the food was more important than anything else. So you would think like, okay, you know what? I It's hard for me to wipe myself. This should be a sign to stop. No. Instead, I adapt. You know? It's hard for me to reach certain parts of my back. Instead, I adapt. I get a brush so I can get back there when I'm showering, you know? Um, it's hard for me to reach my shoes and get the end, you know? E- even with a shoehorn, I can't reach. I'm too big. I get an extended shoehorn so I can stand and do it. Like, I just kept adapting wow. to being fat. And and the funny thing is, at the point where I couldn't get off the sofa, it was hard. That was a make-or-break moment. Is this the point where, like, people just, like, give up and inside screw it? And they just sit in the stairs, sit in the chair, or lay in the bed all day, and they just decide, like, okay, you know what, I just can't do it. And they adapt. Like, you know, no problem. I can't get up. It's hard for me to move. People got to bring me food. Like, and the thing is, I used to watch uh, programs like that and think to myself, oh, my God, how does this person let themselves get like that? Why? Because I was obese, but I was ambulatory. I was walking around. I was driving, things like that. So when I would watch My 600 Pounds Life, here I am passing judgment and slowly but surely, I was headed towards that same path. You know, I was fortunate enough that the love of my son snapped me out of it. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's like, 
you fa and this is what I mentioned in a video recently with um, C Dub, the YouTuber that I interviewed um, that lost a lot of weight, uh, is finding a why big enough. And you obviously found a why big enough. And, like you had such a burning big reason why to do it, which helped you stay on track. And apart from the benefits you just mentioned, did you notice any benefits like energy wise, cognitive function wise, mood wise, just the way you think or any other types of benefits that go with that? Well, uh, the, the other benefit too that I forgot was um, I used to have high blood pressure. Um, I had to take a 10 milligram of enalapril, um to keep it under control. Now the high blood pressure is something that like, I was always big, but high blood pressure is something that came like in uh, 2015 where now I needed medication to, to, to uh, take care of it. Um, so like after fasting about 40 days, I didn't need that. Um, I had uh, like poor circulation in my lower leg. Um, they were real dark and whenever you would press on them, it would the indentation of where you press would stay. It's called pitting edema, wow. right? And like that doesn't happen no more. Like I could press it right now, it snaps right back into place. The color, the color's coming back. So the circulation is getting better in there. Now, as far as cognitive function, yes, I felt sharper. But by the same token, fasting also made me more quick, uh, quick tempered. Like I would lose it quickly over like wow. the smallest thing in business. Even my wife knows she's like, you know, this maybe you hangry, but this fasting <laughs> thing is really taking its toll because you get upset over the smallest thing. And it's true, too, because since I ended the fasting, like the same thing that would get me upset in business like I just take it and strive. Like it's nothing. It's no big whoop. Whereas before, <laughs> I was maniacal by what do you mean? You know. <laughs> That's very interesting. Yeah. And what's um, you on any other type of medication before you started fasting? No, or no. It was just it was just uh, the high blood pressure medication. Yeah. And you and you're completely free from taking the medication now. Is yes. That correct. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Knock cool. on wood. Yeah. Yeah. That's really really good. Um, and also, yeah, you said that you decided to embark on a 30-day water fast. So how did 30 days go into 150-plus days? Let me tell you. <laughs> um, um, what I, I, I didn't know if I could go as long as Angus. So my whole thing was like, look, you know, take it slow. You know, you try 30 days. If it gets too much and you can't make it 30, at least make it to 7. Make it to 10. And we could deal with that. But just make it to something. Don't quit after two, three, four days, right? So I made the seven, no problem. Ten, no problem. By the time, like, by the time I saw my YouTube channel, which was day eight, I realized I would do 30 days with no problem because I was just never hungry. It was like a different feeling, like this this constant feeling of being sated. And I knew at that point it was just a mental game. The only thing that could get me to break it wasn't any phys anything physical. It was just mental. My mental demons would get me to break it. Yeah. So I so I I adopted a mantra that like a, I'm not going to eat anything you know at all to break this fast because the food that I will eat will be food that I have tasted all my life that I've had before. It's nothing new, right? And it's going to taste the same when I'm done with the fast. That's one. Now. If Martians come to visit Earth and they got some Martian cuisine and they're going to leave in like a week and that's my only chance to taste it, that would be the only reason I break the fast. And that's the mantra I ran. Like there's nothing worth breaking the fast because the food is going to be the exact same food you've had all your life. It's no big deal. There's nothing to rush to. And I just kept reiterating that. And like I kept that mantra going. Then the next mantra was... Your body is the one thing in the universe you have complete dominion over. You don't have control over your son. You don't have control over your wife. You don't have control over the environment. You don't have control over, over the government. You have limited control over your finances. But your body, you have complete dominion over it. Exercise that dominion. You're the captain of this starship enterprise. You keep it going. And pretty much like... That was the thing that I beat into my head to deal with the, the to deal with the uh, mental demons, in order to beat it back. So after thirty days, I was like, you know what? I could do another thirty days. Thirty days turned to sixty, then it turned to ninety. Then it's like in my mind, it's like I could really push this. <laughs> like let me see, let me see, because because my whole thing was I needed to do this long enough to break the food addiction. And there's been plenty of people that I've seen on YouTube who did 30 day fast, who did 40, 50, 60 days fast, and they got big again. Like after the fast, they didn't break the addiction. So to me, 
the key the key to breaking the addiction um lied somewhere in the Angus range. So I set out to do that. But around after a hundred days or so, I started to realize that my feeling for food was no longer the same. Like I didn't care about like, you know, I wasn't planning refeeding. In the beginning, I used to watch a bunch of YouTube videos about um, um, ketogenic cooking and, and, and how to make this, how to make uh, cloud bread and things like that. And I was watching it like all the time in my spare time. And my wife told me that, you know what? That's food porn. That's just your yeah. addiction manifesting itself in another way. You know, like, like, and I'm like, no nonsense. I, you know, when I come off, I'm going to do keto. So I need to, to train myself. You know how I do research. He's like, that's not research. That's you holding on to food still. And she's right, because true enough, there came a point where I didn't watch any of that. I still plan on doing keto. I didn't watch it. I didn't plan what my first meal was going to be. I didn't plan anything. It was just like, I'm just going. Like the Energizer Bunny. I'm just going, going, going. And I felt at that point, that was the time where the addiction cycle was broken in my mind. So by the time I hit 150, you know, uh, me and my wife decided, you know, like we talked about it because we would talk every time, like after day 60, like to go 90, to go 120, to go 150. So I told her I could go 180, but she's like, yes, but do you feel like, you know, like it's going to make a difference in terms of how you feel about food? And I told her, no, I don't think so. Uh... I think like, you know, I think honestly, like I could stop right now and I'm good. You know, so so we decided like we would stop and I reintroduce food into my into my system, get the new discipline going with the OMAD and start hitting the gym. Because more importantly, I couldn't hit the gym in terms of weightlifting when I was uh, on the extended fast. Like I could do light cardios. Like I did a lot of walking about, a you know, an hour a day. I did um, the biggest moves of DPD daily right after the walk. But as far as like pumping iron and seriously lifting, to build bulk, I couldn't do it when I was fasting. So one of the best things about like, you know, going back to eating and, and doing the, the 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 OMAD is I'm getting enough protein where like now I'm back in the gym trying to build the muscles up, which is also going to help burn fat and tone me yeah. down. Yeah, wow, that yeah, that is just inspiring for me to hear that. And it's so good for you to hear the other things that you did. You didn't just do the fasting because yeah, I've met many different people that go on fasting retreats for 30 days or so and then they come back, they start eating the same way they did before and they don't have the things in place to do something consistently in their everyday life, which doing something consistently over a long period of time is the best thing. And yeah, it's so good that you just listen to your body rather than just ending it at 30 days. You're like, oh, I can go more. And you did it in a, in a really safe way and for really, really good reasons. And the huge things that you mentioned you had those two mantras you worked on your mind you was really changing your mindset around everything that you was programmed with we obviously changing beliefs at the same time consciously or unconsciously and you just really seem to have put everything in place so it could work the best for you and so you could actually get to the point which is the biggest and most amazing thing that you realize you didn't need to fast any longer you notice you broke the food addiction and you notice that you was using um, in, like say like videos as food porn and I know so many people that are on restrictive diets yet they watch people eating all the other foods they can't eat and it's just like it's really not breaking the addiction they're just avoiding the foods that yes. they don't eat and getting in another way so it's a really important point that you mentioned so it's yeah that's man yeah that inspires me like he hearing that you did all of those different things and I think it's so important for people to hear those because that's where so many people go wrong because they don't do some of those things and get to that point that you did with your relationship around food yeah yeah I mean, it was a, I, 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 I can't say it was easy but I can't lie and say it was hard either it was it just was you know yeah. it's something that I underwent my body underwent and I'm I'm, I'm, I'm the better for it yeah. I feel like whereas Whereas in December, I was looking at purchasing um, 7X shirts. Now I wear 3X. This right here is a 2X. You know, so like I'm feeling wonderful. Yeah, no, it's, that's really, really good. And how was you feeling during the water fast? Obviously, it would have fluctuated at different points. But did you have to be bed bound the whole time? Could you still work? Like what was you doing in your average well, days? Well, fortunately enough for me, I work from home. So it was easier for me because, like, I have a lot of commenters when they talk about, like, 
well, I drive truck, you know, I work, you know, I'm, I'm a mover and things like that. And I have to think if I had a nine to five, a traditional nine to five, where I was going outside my house and now the co-workers are in the break room with the coffee cakes, it's someone's birthday or like, you know, everyone's like coming back. Hey, we're going to lunch. You want something? Would that have tempted me more? Like I would need a little bit more oomph yeah. in order to really fight that off. Whereas when I'm in my, my son's not going to tempt me. I mean, other than the time when I have to cook for him, you know, and I refrain from tasting his food and like I have to actually put a thermometer to see if it's hot. Because I can't, like, you know, put the thing near me. But, like, there's nothing really tempting me. It's, like, easier to stay disciplined because I'm in the house. Now, don't get me wrong. Once a week, I would go to my mother's house because um, um, she would cook dinner for us. Now, what I told her was, you know, at the time, you know, I since told the truth, was I was doing an intermittent fasting, um, an OMAD regiment with a one-hour window. And that window was always in the morning. So by the time I go to the house, I, I ate already. I'm good, you know. So she knows the weight loss. I mean, in the beginning, I told her I was doing a liquid, a liquid fast, a liquid diet. But she's a retired nurse. I can't keep that yeah. same excuse for months on in. So then I, I, you know, from researching um, the OMAD, I knew so much about it that I was able to bluff her. Like, oh yeah, I'm doing the OMAD. That's why I'm losing all the weight, you know. But like, her food is always tempting. But I reached a point where it was like, you know, my wife's eating and. She's eating, they're feeding the kid, and it means nothing to me. I was just like, okay, you know? And yeah. I, I went to parties and things like that and just ignored it, just kept drinking my water. It, slowly but surely, I built the discipline where, like, I wasn't even tempted. And then there was a point where, like, I could care less. I felt kind of superior. Like, I don't need to eat. You guys do. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really, really good to hear because, yeah, for anyone to just have no food around them during a whole extended fast is going to be very, very difficult. And like you said, it wasn't like you're finding it really, really hard to not eat those things. It's like once you get your body, once for me, I can say this, I'm sure you can relate to this and anyone else that extended fast. Once I'm set in my mind to an extended fast, it's here. I don't have a desire for food. There isn't the temptation. It's like, but with intermittent fasting and I know that I'm going to eat a specific time, that's a whole different thing. That um, is totally different. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, with the exception of the fact that I was doing um, keto. So I had to plan out my food, you know, but I'm not doing keto for life. Like I said, I've, I'm switching regiments and then I am going to do OMAD for life. But the best thing about OMAD is I know I'm going to eat. I'm going to eat the next day at a specific time. And this one. So it's it's easy. And then not to mention, I'm not rigid with my OMAD schedule. It's not like, OK, I'm only eating from uh, from 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 two to six every day. And that's it. No. I got a flexibility point, whereas if my business partner comes in from out of town and he wants to have uh, dinner, I move my window to later on. Like, I'm able to adjust, you know, so that, you know, life, which happens, doesn't, like, become tedious where, like, you're at a party and everyone is having fun and this, that, you're sitting there, oh, no, you plan around it. Okay, I'm not going to eat today at 2 because I'm going to this party at 8 o'clock. And I'm going to eat the healthy stuff at that party, and that that'll, that'll take care of my keto, my my OMAD for the day. Yeah, that and that's really good because it's like so many people can become quite rigid with whether it's intermittent fasting or other various uh, changes with their diet. Where it's like, and I had experience with this. I used to be like, right, I eat at this specific time every day, and this is when it ends, and it was causing me mental stress. It was not. Yes, I have a very yes. busy. I have a very busy lifestyle as well. So rigidity can just cause you stress, and it can make it harder to sustain. So it's good that you exactly. have that flexibility. Yeah. Yes, it'll, it'll, it'll make you fail. Like literally, like like a lot of the diets I failed that was because of the rigidity, you know. But like now, because I, I'm free flowing with this, like you know. Um, I have my set time, but if you let me know ahead of time, like, you know, I had a friend, um, um, come from out of town and he was like, yeah, I'm going to be in New York. You want to meet up around, around noon. And in my mind, it's like, okay. But from the time I meet him, I have the flexibility of eating anytime he wants to eat. You know what I'm saying? So like when he's ready to eat, I'll eat. Whereas if I had like that set time, it's like, yo, we have to hit some place by X amount of time, you know? Yeah, and it's stress for everyone. Yes, yeah, so it's really good to hear that as well because it's like by being more flexible, you can just, it can make you be more social and actually join in on the, the food, connecting with other people because obviously food is such a huge thing for people to connect over. So 
yeah, it's re really, really good that you managed to get to that point as well. Um, and let me see. Da -da -da -da. I was going to mention something then. Hmm. Ah, okay. So whilst you're doing the water fast, was there any points with the water fast where you thought maybe I'm getting into like a dangerous territory with this or I should quit now due to one reason or another where you was finding it like really hard, difficult? Was there any points where it was just becoming too much for you mentally or emotionally that you thought you maybe had to quit or was there any huge challenges for you? That's what I'd say. No, no, I have to be honest, absolutely not. Like the hardest part, was literally that first week. Then after that, every week got easier, every month got easier. There was no point. There was one time where um, I went, like I believe almost eight or nine hours without water where I felt a little bit loopy, a little bit lightheaded, you know, but that was about it. And because of that experience, that's why I never tried dry fasting because I'm like, look, I went like, you know, I went like, you know, eight, nine hours without water and I felt lightheaded. Now. That might have had nothing to do with it. You know, it might have just been a coincidence. But because of that, I kept it in mind that I'm pretty regular with drinking water throughout the day. And the one time circumstances took water away from me, you know, I felt. But then again, you know, I was doing a lot of walking. So maybe I did use up, you know, like a lot of energy and stuff. But I because of that, that was the only time where I was like, well, something's wrong. here. I don't feel right. You know, <laughs> and as soon as I drank a bunch of water, I was perfectly fine. Okay, that's really good you mentioned that because I was going to ask about dry fasting and see if you've done any. And obviously, yeah, dry fasting can be done, but it's something that people need to be way more careful with. And it's especially on such a long fast like yours, uh, it's definitely not the best thing. Yeah, I do promote it, but definitely not for long periods of time. So it's good that you're able to, yeah, be mindful around that and make sure that you were well hydrated. And, and yeah, was you still able to work and get on with what you needed to in your day whilst doing the water fasting? I was able to work. I was able to take care of my son's son's need with no problem. Like the water fast didn't influence me at all. I, I was still able to drive. Like everything was just normal. Once I settled into a routine, there was no difference. Every day I just felt sated. Like I wasn't hungry. I wasn't, I, you know, I wasn't full. It was just that feeling you have between lunch and dinner where you have a little snack to hold you over. That's how I felt all the time. And I was fine with it. And like I said, each, you know, each day goes by, it just made me stronger. Like, you know, the uh, the um, physical craving, you know, the hunger part went after five days. The mental craving went after about, I would say, like 22, 23 days. That was the end of the mental battle. And then the overall caring, given the jack about food, went after like 90 days or so. Yeah. Yeah, they, that's, that's really good to hear. And it's like... So many people obviously get concerned about fasting. You say you're starving, it's going to start eating all your muscles and your organs. But obviously for yourself, someone who had a lot of excess body fat, you've just got so much fuel stored on you and you're just tapping into it. You're getting the ketones. So it's like you're not just running on nothing. You're getting a really good food source and you're not eating foods like most people do on a standard American diet, which is making your blood sugar levels go up and down. You have like, it's just stable. There's no crashes, there's no highs. You know, the other thing, too, people fail to, to, to remember, like your body's getting protein from autophagy because your body is breaking down like all that extra skin, all these extra connective tissue that it no longer needs as you shrink down. That has protein in it. It yeah. doesn't have to attack your muscle. It could attack the um, source, the things that's unnecessary in your body. That's what autophagy is all about. You yeah. know, so like, yeah, your body's getting plenty of protein, too. You yeah. know, this is why, like, I've lost all this weight and there's really no signs of loose skin i mean i have a little bit of like you could you can look and see like yeah that kind of look like loose skin but it's not like drooping like i'm yeah. melting like like a candle wax or anything like that it's like i've always been this size ah uh, that's really good you mentioned that because so many people on extreme calorie restriction diets that don't do like intermittent fasting or extended fasting they a lot of them will lose the weight rapidly but because they haven't got autophagy it's not eating up all the loose skin is made up of. So it's really good exactly. to hear that you, that you notice exactly. that you haven't got all that loose skin. Because that's a huge no. issue for people. And then obviously so many people need to go down the surgical route and cosmetic route for that, which is not the healthiest thing to do. So yeah, that's... I know. A, a, a lot of people ask me about that. And I tell them like, look, you know, since I'm doing OMAD, um, and, and on top of that, I, on top of the OMAD, I want to add one random day a week of uh, fasting. 
um, so that, you know, pretty much I get like 52 days of fasting a year, you know? Um, so on top of doing the OMAD, I want to do that. I haven't done that yet, even though I plan on doing it because, again, my stomach is so small. I don't feel I get enough food just eating the way I do now. So for me to add a fasting day in between seemed a little bit like too much, but I'm working through the process. I'm coming up with a, you know, a different routine where I might be able to do that, you know, involving more like nutritional shakes to make up for, um, the lack of calories and things of that nature. But, you know, I tell people all the time, like if I, if I'm stuck with loose skin, I'll just pretty much wait until, um, you know, like until the autopsy take care of it. It could be two, three, four years, but I'm not going to get surgery because my wife is the only person I have to, to be naked in front. And she's used to a 530-pound frame. She can handle a little extra skin. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, yeah, I'll move on to, like, the refeeding thing in a short while. But I want to ask you one question. During the whole fast, and because and, and, I know a lot of people are going to wonder this, a lot of people ask this, during the whole time, did you have no number twos whatsoever? Or were they just, did you have them frequently? Or how was that? I think it's very important for people to let know. Me, let me tell you, in the, in the beginning... I started having uh, these, li after all the size was out, I started having liquid number twos uh, probably once or twice a week. Then it became once a week. And there was a point where, like, I wasn't having any number twos. Now, because I had studied on, uh, you know, I studied uh, Angus's route, I knew this was natural because Angus sometimes would go, like, two, two, three months without a, a number two. Wow. So um, I wasn't worried about it. But the thing is, when I still was having number two and I was getting to the refeeding part, and it's more than not having number number two, like there was a point where like like uh when I started refeeding where like I felt like I wanted to go but nothing was coming out, no matter how hard I pushed, but it felt like something was there. So I went and got it checked out and um the doctor told me I had a fecal impaction. You know? Uh -huh. Now, that fecal impaction is basically a, a stool that's just hardened, like, yeah. you know, in that area, and it's just not coming out. It's Because the other thing, too, from not pooping so long, the anus shrinks also. So there's no way to, you know, oh, to, wow. to get the fecal out without feeling like, you know, you're in a, a gang rape scene from a prison yard, you know? <laughs> so, so as a result of that, um, it, it affected, because what I wanted to do is I wanted to go right to the gym. But the thing is, I needed the fecal impaction out because the doctor started giving me um, stool softeners and, you know, to take enemas. And I can't be in the gym working out on a treadmill. All of a sudden, I feel like going. I'm running to the bathroom like Freddy Krueger's chasing me. And then I don't make it. And boom, brown out right there in the gym. So, like, I put off the gym until the fecal impaction was gone. And fortunately enough... It left me on the 4th of July, making it a true Independence Day. And then the 5th of July is when I started back at the gym. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's that's really cool to know. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's interesting. And, yeah, so on to the refeeding. What did you break your fast with? And what I forgot to mention is there will be a link down below for his YouTube channel. So you can check that out. He documented, like, so much of this. Like, it was making so many videos. You can learn so much. And the refeeding as well, not just the extended fasting. So, yeah, what did you break the fast with and what, how did you decide to break the fast with the specific food well, and why? Well, the, the, the general consensus, because, you know, you had some people that was like, well, break the fast with a fruit, you know, with, with watermelon, things of that nature. Now, someone told me that, you know, your body's been pure, of sh you know, without sugar, fructose for so long. If you introduce that sweetness to your body, you're going to send it to shock. You know, uh, so the general consensus, you know, because it's not like, you know, if you're breaking a 30 day fast with that, fine, 40. But I went 150 days and there's real. Now, what I do remember is Angus Barbieri broke his fast with a boiled egg and a slice of bread. Yeah. So he broke it with a boiled egg, the protein and a carb. And he didn't suffer from anything. So I pretty much know like, OK, there's a safe route to go. But a lot of people, the general consensus was bone broth. So the first thing I broke it with was um, I had um, uh, four ounces of bone broth for a four-hour window, right? So I would have four ounces of bone broth uh, every hour within that window time because pretty much what am I doing? It's just like instead of drinking water, I'm drinking flavored water, you know? Yeah. 
So that was the first thing. Then the next day, um, I, 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 you know, since Angus did break it with an egg, the next day I, uh, I broke an egg into the bone broth. So I had an egg drop soup kind of, you know. And then from there, I had, uh, I believe it was uh, split pea soup, tomato soup. And then slowly but surely, I, re I reintroduced the food group into my system, saving the carbs for last. No, I saved the fruits for last. And I have to say, the first time I had a pineapple after the fast had to be the most eclectic feeling in the world. <laughs> the, the flavors, it was the most delicious pineapple I ever had in my life. Like that sweetness was incredible. Nice. That's really good. And yeah, it's definitely a really, yeah, that's really good to hear that you did break it with bone broth because obviously it's really nutrient dense. It's a liquid source, but it's giving you back so many different minerals, collagen, so many other things. So, yeah, that's really good to hear. And then when, when did you say you started going back to more like solid food meals completely? How long after the refeeding? Well, the refeed took 12 days. I had some solid within that 12 days. But again, remember... I had the fecal impaction, so I was very gingerly, gingerly about the the the, the solids. Because for some reason, I envisioned food backing up, backing up, backing up, and then you read about like fecal impaction could kill you, and things like that. So I get oh. paranoid over things like that. So like a lot of the food I had was more heavily soup-like, you know, because my theory was like it, you know, it'll be easy to pass around the fecal impaction, you know, with the food softener. You know, I was going a little bit at a time, like a little bit here, a little bit there. So I had more of that. Than, I would have solid food once in a while, but I wasn't having a ribeye or anything like that because I didn't want anything stuck in the colon, you know, that long. Um, once the impaction went, that's when I was having steak and ribs and things yeah. of that more heavier food that I know yeah. is going to pass through me because yeah. there's nothing blocking it anymore. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's amazing to hear that you did it so slowly and gradually because obviously that's where so many people go wrong with the reef feeding. So, yeah, it's very helpful for people to know. And just so we can become a, a, aware of, like, the weight loss, how much weight did you lose during the extended fast for 152 days and how much weight have you lost since the reef feeding phase? Do you know? Okay, now here, go, here this is where it gets tricky because what happened was I weighed myself before the fast. That's how I knew I was five, before the intermittent fasting. That's how I knew I was 530. Now, when January 2nd came, I didn't weigh myself. Okay. I was so paranoid and busy concentrating on actually being successful with the fast itself. I didn't weigh myself until day six okay. of the fast, maybe day seven or six. But when I weighed myself, I stepped on the scale and realized I weighed 491 pounds. So I went from 530 to 491 pounds in that time. And that's when I decided, you know what? I should document this. And that's when I, you know, ah. on day eight, I started a YouTube channel. And oh, it wow. wasn't until day 10, I officially weighed myself. And that was 487 pounds for the YouTube audience to see. But like, you know, that's pretty much how that started. Now, um, when I finished fasting on uh, May 31st, I got down to, I believe, I got down to 305, right? Yeah. Was it 305? Or did I, get to, I got down to 305, right? During the refeeding, I gained nine pounds, you know? Shot back up to 314. And then slowly but surely through the OMAD, I've come down from 314 to 292 yeah okay cool and yeah just uh people yeah obviously you gain some weight back but what is obviously that's not fat that's not muscle uh it's just pretty much water weight which could freak some people out but obviously that's just a natural thing that is going to happen well, I, I expected it like you yeah. know one of the things i do like i did because of this was a lot of research and i knew i was going to gain gain weight like some people had a formula and if you follow that formula i should have gained like 25 30 pounds you know, so I was quite happy with only nine pounds of, of, of weight gain, you know, but um, I expected the weight gain and I braced myself for the weight gain. And also I told myself, it don't make a difference if you gain the weight. You're going to continue to do what you're doing to lose this weight. Like there's no turning back because the one thing that, you know, it's like the definition of insanity. I'm not going to try the same thing and expect a different result. So this eating and putting things off, I'm not ever doing it again because, like the result is going to be me being obese again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 
And um, when you switch to one meal a day keto, have you been tracking your calorie intakes? You're making sure that you're in a calorie deficit or not? Well, the, the thing is, it's not so much a calorie deficit. What I try to do is I try to get 18, 1,800 to 2,000 calories a day. And really 1,600 to 2,000 calories a day, you know, based on what I cook. Like, you know, if it come up like 16 and change, I'm not going to go crazy and add like, you know, something to it to make it 2,000. It is what it is, you know? I have been in the caloric deficit in, in the fact that my stomach is small, so it's harder for me to get everything in, you know, like, you know, so I, you know, I set out to, to have 16, 1800 calories, end up eating 12 by the time my window closed, things of that nature, you know, but, you know, a lot of stuff I make is nutrient dense anyway, so I'm not too worried about it. Plus, I started incorporating the keto shake into the regimen to make sure I get the proper nutrition also. Uh, okay, and are you using the MCT uh, C8 oil? I think that's what I can see in the background. I'm very aware yes, of that Yes, I oil. am. Yeah. Yes, I am. Yeah, nice. Yes, and and how am. come, and is there any specific reason why you added that in? Do you find that it's helped you in any way, shape, or form? Would you recommend that? If, well, yeah. I, I added it in because I, you know, again, I, I, you know, I got a lot of good things out of it, but I really added in to, to, to add the, the fat and the calories to the meal. So I would throw that into a shake. You know, just to boost it up. Is there anything else that you've continued to do alongside like OMAD and exercise to give you the best weight loss benefits or is that just what you're doing? No, I mean, pretty much just the OMAD the exercise. I mean, mentally, I'm tough. I don't have to really tell myself anything. It's like, you know, to, to me, the, the crazy thing is like, you know, whereas I used to look forward to eating every day, eating is kind of like a burden like i'm in the middle of something i'm like damn i gotta eat you know it, which is crazy like, i used to look forward to it like oh i can't wait to eat but now it's like oh, what time is it ah let me get, <laughs> let me get this out the way you know so like you know other than like you know i i walk a little bit more there hasn't been anything different i'm doing um although like my weight loss has slowed from the omad like i'm i'm finding that i'm losing about two pounds a week which is good, but my goal was to get to 195 pounds by December. You know what I'm saying? So this is one of the reasons why I want to switch up from the keto OMAD to another OMAD, you know, uh, okay. to see if that'll pick up, like maybe carnival OMAD, you know, that's something I'm going to yeah. announce. But just to see if the weight loss will pick up. And then, like, you know, I have in my back pocket, like, you know, around October, if need be, I could always do 30, 60 days, you know, it's in my back pocket. But, you know, just so I could get to my goal weight, only because I said as a goal. I mean, I know I'm going to get to 195 regardless, you know, but I already set as a goal for December. I envision it being December. So, like, you know, I want to get it by December, you know. Now, if it, if it, you know, December comes, I'm 220, 230 pounds. I'm not going to cry over it, you know. It is what it is. I'll just get there in, uh, in January or February. But I feel I owe it to myself to do everything possible to achieve that goal by December because I set that goal for myself. Yeah, yeah, that's so good that you like, you're just being as mindful as possible and adjusting where necessary. You're trying out some different things since you've been refeeding and just, yeah, which is really, really good rather than being stuck to one mindset and being like, right, I'm only doing this exactly. due to dogmatic, dogmatic views or ideologies that have been taken on from other people and so forth. Exactly. Yeah, and if you had anything to share with the viewers to anyone that's going to do like extended fasting, is there any like tips that you would give to people prior to doing any extended fasting? The, 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 tip, the tips I always give is simple. One, first make sure you're fat enough because I had a commenter um, on, on YouTube tell me that she tried fasting and, you know, she became sick. She had a problem with her liver and all this other thing. And she started at 120 pounds. Like, what are you fasting for? I don't understand. You know, she started at 120 pounds and tried to do a 40-day fast, you know? And, you know, so my first tip is, like, make sure you're fat because I'm built for fasting. All this right here is like a nuclear power plant, you know, for, for my body to feed off of, you know? So, like, I mean, get, think about it. The human body is designed um, pretty much to store fat for rainy days. That's pretty much, I mean... You know, before the commercialism of food, um, we would go out, we hunt our food, we bring it back, we eat, we're stuffed for days, and then when we're hungry again, when we feel that first gnawing, like, hmm, I'm hungry, then we go hunt again. We didn't hunt and keep things like stockpile 
you know, in, in, in the snow for us to eat throughout the day. We didn't do that. That's something that, like, you know, the big business came along and, you know, started like, hey, look, you're supposed to eat three times a, a day. No, you're supposed to eat when you're hungry. You know, when you're hungry, your body tells you when it's time to eat. You know, there's, yeah. this regular schedule of eating stuff is the, I mean, think about it. Prior to uh, World War II, there was no obesity. Yeah. Why? Because back then, there wasn't this commercialism of food. People was more worried about food shortages than anything else. After World War II, everything started booming. The economy started booming. Um, and more things popped up. The commercialization of our farmland, our agriculture, you know, our livestock. So now you go to the supermarket and everything is right there for you, you know. So there's plenty. Now, these people, they got to make money from, from their investment. So what do they do? They start with the commercials, you know. Hey, eat this. You know, it went from eating three times a day to now you're supposed to eat, like, you know, a snack in between. Really? Like, you know, and nobody cares about us getting fat because what I come to learn is, like, the food industry will make money from you. You get fat. That's not a problem because they have the, the billion-dollar weight loss industry that's going to make money from you. They got the, the, the billion-dollar um, medical industry that's going to make, make money from you. Everyone is going to make money from you, regardless. So nobody cares if you get fat. You got to care. <laughs> yeah, and that is such an important factor for people to be aware of. It's like the food industry make foods in a way, especially packaged processed foods, so it's addictive to you. They yes. don't care about your health yes. at all. And then the medical industry, they want to get you, make you sick. They want to teach you the wrong information. You could call it propaganda or whatever, but doctors are the real drug pushers. That's what I call them. They're not. Exactly. They're not health Every educators. Nobody tries to solve the problem. Everything is just dealing with the problem because you know what? There is no money in the cure. You know, the <laughs> money is in the treatment. The money is it's like any drug dealer. You got to keep coming back for the treatment. That's where the money's at. You know, they don't want to invent something something to, to, to like I've always said this, even even uh, before the fast or anything. I'm like, if anybody came up with a cure for the common cold, right? If he didn't just relinquish the patent and take the money and keep his mouth shut, he'd be dead. Because, like, you're costing billions of dollars, you know, for the treatment of the common cold. Like, nobody wants, yeah. to, wants you to give a shot, and all of a sudden, no one ever gets a cold in their life. Are you kidding me? You're going to put people out of work. Yeah, exactly. And, like, the medical industry do not want to people know that are obese. Just don't eat. Where's the money in that? Like, at all. <laughs> no. Listen, I, I've, I've fasted 150 days, and, and many people will come and say, like, I'm surprised uh, mainstream media hasn't said this. I'm surprised the medical industry hasn't said this. They're not going to. They nobody. This is free. This isn't costing anything. This is free. Yeah, and the obesity epidemic is a multi-billion-dollar industry for so many different companies out there. And it's like the longer they can keep you like that, the more they can just keep taking that money, like on and on and on. And it, and it's, Listen, <sighs> yeah, you, you got to remember there's, there's 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 people born every day. So there's an unlimited resource of untapped people. So they don't care if you get fat and die. You know, everyone, after you used up, you know, the funeral parlor makes money from you too. And you're buried. <laughs> and the sky high prices. And yeah, the sky high prices of caskets, pillows for the caskets, blanket for the casket, the burial plot. Everyone makes money from you. And then when you're gone, guess what? They have your kids. They have your kids' kids. There's always a generation that's going to feed the machine. Yeah, and, and if you look into like the history, I've done this before, I can't remember the exact year, but breakfast didn't used to exist. It's something that companies created and said it's the most important meal of the day. So they've ingrained that into people, but there's no scientific research to show like breakfast or even five or three meals a day are actually healthy for you, like at all. There's no studies out there on that at all. It's just a load of crap. There's not, <laughs> the, the re actually, the research shows that OMAD is the way we're supposed to be living. One meal a day is the, the the optimal healthy thing to do. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's really it's really really crazy the world that most of us live in with where we've just been programmed by so many these companies, and that's why we have the epidemic obesity going on. And it's like obviously then people just have no discipline whatsoever. They're fed misinformation that oh it's just due to genetics why you're obese and due to your family members and stuff like that. And it's just like man, it's so good to hear people like yourself that of taking control and empower themselves and learn something that actually works. So then you can actually do what you've done and share a positive message 
to the world and help so many people and break the back and make the the pharmaceutical industries and food industry lose so much money which is a really good thing <laughs> exactly exactly yeah yeah it's really good so is there anything else that you would like to share with anyone before we end the call in a short while that you think would be valuable for them to hear well if you uh, uh, you getting back because because I veered off the original question. Like, make sure you have enough fat. Make sure you take your electrolytes and nutritional supplements, the things that your body can't produce from burning fat. Make sure you let your doctor in on what you're doing because the best thing that happened to me was my doctor monitoring everything and me being able to actually see that a what I'm doing is right and b at one point where when my um, iron level was low. He was able to tell me, and I just got the supplement to boost up the iron level. So it's, so it's very important you let your doctor in on what you're doing. Other than that, it's like I said before, like your body is the one thing you have absolute dominion over. There's nothing else in the universe that you have more control over than your body. Exercise that control. A lot of morbidly obese people go through life treating themselves as victims, as if like this is being done to them. No. You're doing it to yourself. You have the wherewithal within you to stop doing what you're doing. Just break out of the conundrum. That's what I did. Yeah, yeah, that's so good to hear. Yeah, that would be very inspiring for people to hear and motivating. Yeah, and yeah, not that I have any excess body fat to leave, but you've inspired and motivated me. It's really good to, to hear some of the things you said. I know a lot of what you said, but there's some things that I've learned and that I can apply into other areas of life as well. So that's, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. It's cool. So like I said, I put a link down below for his YouTube channel. Definitely go there and make sure you subscribe. And yeah, like he's got some very valuable information he can share in those videos and he could talk about even more than what we talked about through the amount of videos he's got. He's got so many videos, it's really good to see that he's putting himself out there because it can be quite a vulnerable thing to do that on YouTube, but it's a brilliant self-development tool for people as well. So yeah, so yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, cool. So before we end the video, as always, don't forget to like the video, share it with others, leave your questions down below for me or the Fasting Fat Man. And don't forget to subscribe to receive a lot more videos. And I'm going to have a lot more interviews coming with a lot of other amazing people done long fast as well. So, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. Make the most of it. And, yeah, just embrace your day and have the best day ever. Thank you and see you later. Bye.